Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, since we're at Westminster, some of you may remember how when uh, Sadiq Khan was elected mayor, um, Sajid Javid tweeted it and said, um, for one son of a Pakistani bus driver to another, congratulations. Um, not to be outdone, Baroness Wasi then tweeted from this daughter of <laughs> Pakistani bus driver to another, congratulations. This prompted the Times writer Tim Montgomery to observe that bus drivers are clearly the new Etonians. <laughs> I think it's a, it's a great joke, but it's a joke with a point. Um, I mean, it obviously speaks to terrific social mobility. Um, we now have a record number of Muslim MPs, I think it's 13, is that right? That's a thing. Um, and, you know, these politicians are a sign and a symbol of integration. Without social mobility, integration is very difficult. And it's not just politicians either, of course it's not. There are, um, as I found on my travels around Britain, there are uh, role models in every uh, sector, in the media, in the arts, in sport, uh, in business. And of course, why would there not be when uh, Muslims now form 5% of our society in this country? It's an enormous proportion. And, um, and it would be tragic, tragic if we, the rest of us, us non-Muslims, were um, in some way to turn our back on the enormous potential um, that uh, that percentage represents. Um, the nice phrase I like is what we need is Mo Farah and less Farage. Um, could be true. <laughs> um, I spent um, a year, a year and a bit actually, on the road travelling around Muslim Britain and um, and what I came away absolutely convinced was that not only that Muslims are capable of integrating, they are actually doing so. Um, and of course there are problems, but overall I do think that the, um, the outlook is much more encouraging than the orthodox, uh, orthodox view suggests. Um, I'd like to make some two observations really here. Um, one is about language, which has been the topic of the day. Um, and the government is right, I think, to identify um, the lack of good English language schools as an obstacle to integration. I think it is terrible that so many um, tens, hundreds of thousands of people do not speak English uh, as well as they might. Um, and I think that the new money that is being spoken about is very welcome. But um, there is a limit to what government can do. Governments can, and they should, nudge and encourage, and it is so important that they do not bully. Um, and that is the problem, is that the way that the government has um, promoted language skills in the last few years, with some impatience, it looks like bullying, and of course that is counterproductive, that is not going to um, get, to the, uh, get to the goal that we're all looking for. Um, and it also needs to be more consistent. It's not good enough when the government said, you know, as the Cameron government did at one point, to announce not very much money, actually, I think 20 million quid, um, into English language schools, but just after the austerity cuts had cut back English language teaching you know, the year before, it's completely inconsistent. And if the message is not consistent, what message is going to be taken by the communities? So I, I hope that in the future the government will be much more consistent in the way that it applies um, its nudging and encouraging of English language schools. Um, but in any case, um, I'm quite certain that, you know, that the, the limits to what government can do, um, the much more powerful motive for change in this matter of language is actually the children of the first generation, the children's children. A number of times, I've lost count of um, meeting people, you know, young people or people of middle age kind of rolling their eyes at the fact that their own parents still hadn't quite mastered this, you know, been, been patient. It was a sort of a theme. We had it again today from, from Sajid Javid on the radio talking about his own mother, um, who took 15 years to learn uh, English um, got, didn't, got round to it after 15 years when he moved to Bristol, I think. And, um, and he described that experience as being transformational for him. And of course, it is. You cannot begin to get the most out of life in any country if you don't speak the language of that country. So, um, but at the same time, we mustn't push, mustn't bully. It doesn't work. Um, and people are people. They won't be pushed into boxes. Uh, uh, there is no sort of one size fits all in all of this. Um, I, I was very struck by a meeting with the, the then mayor of Oldham, I met on my travels, um, who um, I went to have a dinner with at his house. He was met by an elderly gentleman who spoke no English at all. I, said, I couldn't quite work out who he was. It turned out to be his father, um, who hired, he came over every summer 
to teach his own children English, uh, uh, Punjabi rather, because the children didn't speak a word of Punjabi. So I'm, I'm really worried they're completely losing touch with their roots, you know, so hold the kind of its head. Um, and you, you can't put people in boxes, and I hope we do not do that. Um, second quick point about the two-way street, um, and yes it is, and I very much enjoyed um, Sheikh Mogra's uh, remarks on this, they chime very much with my own views. Um, it's not just that integration has to be a two-way street, but segregation in, in the first place is also a two-way street. Um, and I saw it in action in a number of places around the country. Um, and I think we have to accept that segregated communities are not always um, happy places. Some are, but not all of them are. And I think they have a difficult time thinking perhaps someone like Saddletown and Dewsbury um, uh, has got all sorts of problems. That, uh, but my point is this, is that um, we don't often, as a society as a whole, uh, do enough to recognise that it's a two-way street. I'm talking about white flight. Um, it is a reality in places like Dewsbury. And um, it's unfair to blame the, the, the segregates, if that's a word. Um, and I think as a society we need to do more to acknowledge this phenomenon and that the government could do more to tackle it. Um, I listened to the words of Ted Cantle, who is an interesting sociologist who the government likes and um, did a lot of work into the Oldham race riots in 2001, famously. And he says that we've never tried very hard in this country to sell the idea that mixed communities are exciting, vibrant places in which to live. And, and perhaps we should, actually. Conversely, and it, it's, it, it works the other way too. Um, it's not just the whites who have to do more, it's, it's um, uh, Muslims too. Um, and again, I was extremely struck by a family I met in Allen Rock um, uh, in Birmingham, another um, notoriously, some would say, segregated community. And I, I was chatting to an 11 year old lad there um, who attended a Muslim faith school, and he was into park football, and I was asking him about his football. And he it came out that um, I asked him, so do you have any non-Muslims you play with in the park? He said, no. Um, he didn't know any non-Muslims at all. I mean, not one. He's 11 years old, he never met one. And I was pretty struck by that. This was um, uh, a family, the father was a highly educated um, uh, IT consultant. He moved up to uh, Birmingham from Woking uh, because the, um, the private faith opportunities, education opportunities there were better, in his view. And I pointed this out to, to the dad, and he said, mm, oh, well, yeah, gosh, you've started a thought. Um, and that is an issue. You know? And I was amazed by that, because he was a thoughtful you know, citizen of the world. He kind of thought, but it was almost like he'd slipped in to a sort of segregated state for his son. He, had, he hadn't quite realized. And, and I went away from that evening with pretty convinced that he was going to do something about it. I don't know what, it's up to him. But, but you know, he knew instinctively that a segregated upbringing, as segregated that, as that, was probably not the best thing for his son. And what I took away from that was that it, I think this shows that, that integration, if it is to succeed, um, it requires vigilance and energy and commitment um, in the private sphere, often in the family sphere. Um, it takes a willingness to change uh, on both sides of the divide. Um, governments can set the conditions, they can nudge and they can encourage, but it's a pat point, but I think it's an important one, is that sustained change can only come from within. That's it. Thank you very much.